So today my talk is going to be on improving desalination performance, and this means both energy efficiency and resistance to membrane fouling, essentially dirty membranes, um, using batch trace processes. And I'll be explaining what I mean by batch or a time-varying process. So over this talk, I'm going to give some context on the energy efficiency of her desalination, comparing to various configurations. I'll talk about the basic fundamentals of the batch-based desalination process. Um, I'll show some of the new designs, the energy efficiency results, and then get into membrane fouling, and then discuss cost savings. And show you the new uh, prototype we have that we're building. So the main application for this is on the water energy nexus. So we are solidly on the water side, but also the energy efficiency side. The energy uh, potential improvements are a major driver for this particular technology, as are the applications to have increased uh, recovery ratio, so provide uh, more water out of the incoming uh, uh, feed solution. So you, you can, for instance, improve the uh, recovery for agricultural wastewater. And the main takeaway from this water energy food nexus is that each of the main inputs and outputs are one another for water, energy, and food. So globally, we're having increased water scarcity. Now, this is a map describing um, a water scarcity in index described by the percent of renewable water consumed. So while we have lots of water available in our glaciers, our lakes, etc., if you start draining the lake, bottom of Lake Michigan, boats can no longer get out and move along, right? So you actually have to keep those levels constant. And so we actually want to consume only the renewable water available, which is what comes in from the rain cycle. In many regions, we're actually extracting more than the renewable amount by uh, draining all this groundwater. Uh, and that happens in a lot of places. Uh, a lot of the Midwest, we get our agricultural water from the very large groundwater withdrawals. Uh, the Ogallala Aquifer, one of the largest in the states, has dropped by about 100 feet. So it's kind of like fossil water that we're extracting very rapidly. So we're seeing that about half the world's population uh, lives in areas that are extremely water stressed by essentially using up the majority of their net renewable water, that's the way it's indexed. You'll also see the main population indices have a lot higher density. It's also relatively out of date, so this is in 2000, it's a lot worse today. So we see we have this global supply problem. We're also having dealing with increasing population, and people are moving from inland to the cities where this air problem is the worst. So we're having more and more water scarcity issues, somehow we have to accommodate for that. Now, I'm talking about reverse osmosis today, and so I want to put that in context for the other membrane technologies. So reverse osmosis are membranes that can remove, so right here, that can remove basically everything, right? So we can remove salts, hormones, humic acid, and all the big stuff. As we get to larger um, uh, pore sizes, um, the membranes can reject fewer things, and so these might be pre-treatment technologies or might not be applicable to as many instances. Uh, in some cases, reverse osmosis is kind of like the nuclear option if you want to remove absolutely everything in the water. So we need to increase our water supply. How do we do this? We have global water scarcity. So we can do the increase the supply side, which means we can desalinate seawater, or we can desalinate wastewater, or uh, sewage water, to increase the overall water supply. Alternatively, to deal with the water scarcity issues, we can reduce the demand. Now, a lot of these are not very realistic, favorable, or good ideas, right? Using more efficiency is great, but we can't really just reduce population or reduce the size of the economy or relocate people to areas with more water um, as good solutions. So therefore, if we have so few solutions, actually we very quickly move to using desalination for either seawater or for water reuse. And an important point is that most water reuse in the developed world uses reverse osmosis membranes because they can reject pretty much everything. And if you have sewage water, you have contaminants, you could have heavy metals, you could have a lot of byproducts, you really want those to go through very robust treatment. So to put some context, a global desalination map, the U.S. is actually one of the larger players in desalination, the Middle East relies on it extensively, and many of those countries actually get the majority of their available water from desalination. Some use it a lot for agriculture, such as um, uh, Spain and Israel. Globally, about 300 million people get a significant portion of their water from desalination, uh, serving about 150 uh, countries. And a major issue that's related to this technology, because we can get higher recoveries on wastewater, 
is soil salinization. So if you can think as a global challenge, we're having soils increase in their salinity. And typically, if you have saline soil, you can decrease um, crop yields by up to half. Now, this is a problem for about a quarter of the world's soils. So we really want to increase um, the available low salinity water and reduce the salinity in these soils. This happens from the natural process of just adding lots of water, letting it evaporate, adding it again, letting it go as far as. It's also a major issue in the U.S. when we have um, salting of the roads. So if you actually see satellite images of farmland and there, and you have the roads, uh, in areas where you need lots of salt because you have the snow, you actually should see grounding of crops and reduced yields um, nearby the portion next to the roads. So it is a major issue, and this is one of the uh, pieces of the puzzle that can help treat it. Uh, and this high salinity can reduce agricultural yields by up to half. And again, so these two countries, Spain and Israel, actually get a very significant portion of their water uh, through agricultural water running through these reverse osmosis type membranes. So reverse osmosis is one of many desalination technologies. So what are the other players? When you see reverse osmosis, or RO for short, is the largest share of all global desalination. But there's also a bunch of thermal technologies, as well as some electrically driven technologies. So reverse osmosis uses the high pressure uh, membrane to separate water. The thermal technologies over here, in orange and red, are technologies that use evaporation and recondensation to separate water. So those technologies can provide water um, that is particularly pure, but as you'll see in the next slides, their energy demands are very high. And is one of the reasons why this technology, reverse osmosis, is the one that is kind of taking over as the world view player. And then for low salinity waters, there's all the technologies like electrodialysis, which use electric currents to separate. And so those are essentially, instead of making electrons move around an electric field, they'll make salt ions move around an electric field. Great for removing especially very low levels of salt, but they don't remove everything. They don't remove these uncharged, dangerous compounds. So it's not applicable for every scenario. So we need some basic definitions, and we, want to, we need a framework for how we think about a desalination system. So if you can imagine some desalination system, we need to do a thermodynamic analysis if we want to break theories to increase the overall performance. So let's create a black box and a control volume where we're defining our boundaries. So in an ideal desalination process, we take our water in. It could be seawater, it could be wastewater. And out comes permeate or pure water, and then brine. Now this is a separation process, where suddenly making all the salt leave in one channel and all the pure water go in another. This means that there's some least work that's going to be needed to be put in to make the separation occur. So in a process like reverse osmosis, we're using an electrically driven work input, essentially a mechanical work, to enact the separation. For a thermal process, we could also use a heat process. So we add heat into the system, and then the warmer streams the leave containing that heat, and so your temperatures um, intermediately can be larger um, or higher than the environment. When we evaluate, though, we want to compare for the performance. We want to consider once the temperature is equalized with the ambient environment. And so if this stream ends up leaves hotter, those are going to be associated with energy losses. I try to keep the equations to a minimum on this one. A, there's two we really need to know. The first is the recovery ratio. And essentially, you can think of this as the fraction of desalinating. And it's a ratio of how much pure water you get out, the mass flow rate of the permeate, divided by your incoming mass flow rate and dot of the feed. So for instance, if your recovery ratio um, is 60%, that means that your pure water stream is 60% of the volume of the incoming feed water stream. The other main metric we need is some efficiency metric. The most universal efficiency matrix is the second law energy efficiency. And effectively, um, this is the most universal metric that you can even use to compare thermal systems and mechanical systems versus solar th uh, powered systems. So a very diverse, most generalizable thermodynamic net metric. And essentially, it's a ratio comparing the minimum least work for a separation to occur. So if you recall on the last slide, we had this black box where we have incoming salty water, outgoing pure and saltier water, there's some minimum least work to make the separation occur in a reversible scenario. Whereas, realistically, you're going to be using more than that minimum. And so you have the numerator as your minimum least work, and the denominator by how much work you actually used. 
Another way you can think of this, if you have other processes, is this is your fraction of how close you get to the Carnot efficiency. So 100% is a perfectly efficient process with the second law efficiency here. You're never going to get there, but that's the metric to be judged by. And you can actually break out the components of a process by the second law efficiency of every single piece, right? So we can do the second law efficiency of the pump, which is converting electrical work to mechanical work. But we can also do the second law efficiency of the entire system that's aiming to produce the separation I showed you in the last slide. So how does reverse osmosis compare in terms of energy performance to the other technologies? Um, so overall, we have this uh, comparison between multi-stage flash, so these thermal technologies are the first three, so multi-stage flash mechan um, and multi-effect distillation, which can be coupled with uh, thermal vapor compression as well. Um, and then we have seawater RO shown in gray. Now, seawater RO has actually had improving energy efficiency performance over time. And so uh, in the 70s, where most desalination systems were MSF or thermal processes, it was actually pretty close in terms of its performance compared to those. Over time, this energy need has slowly marched down. But it's still, you know, a fair amount far away from the minimum possible energy needs. Now, even with this excellent improvement, the energy needs are actually fairly substantial and actually drive the economics. You know, the main reason why desalination still has some way to go to be as competitive as municipal water production. So typically, about one-third lifetime cost for uh, reverse osmosis could be on the energy costs. The thermal processes is often more than two-thirds of the lifetime costs. They have the benefit that they're often using lower-grade, low-temperature waste heat, so these numbers aren't quite as bad as they look. And you can see that if you look at the second law efficiency working with a waste heat, you know, low temperature, 100 degrees Celsius, can't really enact that all that much work. So what are the top challenges for desalination? To implement desalination, a membrane technology, and specifically for reverse osmosis, our main challenges are the energy efficiency as well as the membrane fouling. And the efficiency is not only a cost issue, but also many of these plants are powered by electric grids that are not renewable. So the CO2 impact is uh, substantial. And it, it plays a big role in the cost. In the US, the typical cost is about uh, $1.50 as in the time of this talk, but it can be quite variable, it depends on the selectivity. Membrane fouling has also been a long going challenge since the origin of these processes, and is a major research, materials, and process optimization challenge that we do have to deal with. And effectively, when you say fouling, you mean the membrane gets dirty, right? It could be getting dirty with a lot of different things. There could be salts that are crystallized on the membrane. There could be fine particles like silt or silica that are depositing on the membrane. And there could be biofilms forming on the membrane. Biofilms are particularly a challenge in reverse osmosis because these membranes are not robust to the uh, chlorination steps that we normally use to kill all the biofilm organisms. So we typically need to dechlorinate before the membranes. And so biofilms like growing on them. Typically, when you Autopsy with these membranes after they've been in the plant for years of operation, there'll be all sorts of funny colors as opposed to their original white. And you can show some shades of brown, shades of green, because of the biofilms. And the phthalate will actually be the dominant factor in the, in the lifetime operation of most of these membranes. So, now we're talking about batch reverse osmosis. You see the kind of what a reverse osmosis is. What is batch mean, right? Well, in any chemical process, simply a batch process is one where we take a set volume of fluid and do something to it over time and repeat the process. Now, when I'm saying batch in reverse osmosis, I'm saying that we take a set volume of fluid and ideally we actually vary the pressure over time as we vary the salinity over time to improve the efficiency. This is in stark contrast to a standard reverse osmosis process which operates in a continuous fashion. So effectively, and we're looking at some lower brackish water uh, pressures here, um, a standard process will have one constant salinity, and the salinity will increase as it goes farther on along the systems, along the membrane modules, and will really not change until they do a clean maybe once or twice a week. Meanwhile, in a batch process, we're proposing that even on the order of minutes, we're having very large cycling of the pressure and the salinity that occur in the system. And we'll see there's a lot of benefits of doing this. So here I've shown, if you look at this top line here, this shows a graph of the standard energy use in traditional reverse osmosis, and this is looking at relatively high recovery for a brackish water source. And so essentially, in regular RO, you have this high pressure, and then you have some fraction of work 
which is overcoming viscous losses. You have some fraction, which is overcoming the membrane permeability. And so these membranes need some driving delta to P pressure to enact any uh, flow separa uh, separation of um, uh, diffusion through the membrane of the pure water. And then we also have this excess energy, which is beyond what we need. And this is occurring because the final pressure applied needs to exceed the final osmotic pressure, otherwise you get flow in the wrong direction. And it so happens if you graph the fraction desalinated or the recovery ratio defined previously versus the pressure, the areas in each portion are actually directly proportional to PDV work. So by having a process that can change the salinity over time and effectively um, do a curve that goes like this, as opposed to way up here, we can remove this giant chunk of energy needs and thus dramatically improve the efficiency. And so just to, as reminders, this curve here, this is our osmotic pressure, and the area beneath the osmotic pressure is the least work, and that's that very important term from the second law efficiency equation I showed earlier. So effectively, the closer we can get to following this line, the closer we can get to maximum efficiency, and the better our process performance is. So in standard reverse osmosis, effectively we have some pump. It provides this excess pressure I showed you on the far left at the top, which is enough to overcome the membrane permeability for every single membrane module. At the end, out comes your, your brine. And then through every single stage, all these little membrane modules, which are these very wound up uh, membranes for high surface area, you get pure water coming out of low pressure. And then because this brine is still at pretty high pressure, coming at the end of the system I just showed, um, we need some energy recovery device um, that is recovering the high pressure work uh, from the stream. Think of this energy recovery device as behaving a lot like a turbine wood on a hydraulic power plant. It's some high pressure flow, uh, flow. you want to recover that energy. The graphs I showed you before in, in consider, assumes that we have this uh, energy recovery on the drive. So what is the concept for a batch reverse osmosis process? So essentially in this process, um, we want to vary the pressure um, and the salinity simultaneously over time in such a way that they're ideally matched to one another to maximize your performance. Um, so you want these, you have some time-varying high-pressure reservoir that's going to essentially concentrate over time but also change the applied pressure over time to ideally match the osmotic pressure. That's actually a pretty challenging thing to do. And it's so much so, it's why there hasn't been a fully batch process before this work. And so at the end of a batch process, you also need to refill the system and reject the brine um, after each cycle. So it's very, it can be very efficient, but is it really feasible? Right? So here's the main crux of this is how do you make a tank that has these properties? This tank that needs to vary the volume and pressure over time, simultaneously in a reversible pattern. And so you can't really do that with any motor devices, you can't do that with a spring type device, because you need the simultaneous mass control. So how do you do this? Well, here's one of the new configurations proposed to do this. Um, so what we do is we take our pump, instead of pumping the fl fluid, we actually move the pump from the brine to actually uh, pressurize the pure water stream. And so this is acting like a working fluid to help push along the volume uh, and we had a small circulation pump over here just to add a little bit of excess driving pressure. And this can give us a system where this, this volume issue is completely taken care of the fact that we're filling some void space with our pure water. And so by doing this, we can effectively control both the pressure with this pump and have no volume concern so we can reach this ideal osmotic curve. So when we operate this, so over the course of this operation, the pure water continues to replace more of the uh, brine, which is being concentrated. So you're effectively switching the water in the system from uh, saline brine into pure water, and all the salt is staying in one, in one chamber. And that's how you can get it to be extremely efficient. There are also other designs we have which are using an alternative working fluid for this tank. And after you cycle again, we have to reject and refill. So there's another design we have, but I need to explain a particular device first. Uh, and this is a pressure recovery device. So hopefully this volume is not going to be too loud. Um, and so I pointed out earlier that you need energy recovery um, at the end 
of a cycle. So right here, the regular cycle, you need an energy recovery device. This is one such device, and we can actually use it to create an, an alternative configuration for batch RL. This seawater is then exposed to high pressure concentrate at the membranes. Pressure transfers directly from the concentrate to the seawater inside the rubber ducts. Pressure is then transferred to the membranes. So what's happening here is we have this device and we have one salty stream and we have high pressure on this side and low pressure on this side. And it's effectively act acting kind of like a heat exchanger, but instead of exchanging heat, it's exchanging pressure between two different uh, streams. And so it rotates extremely quickly to rapidly ex uh, exchange the pressure um, between both streams. And so typically they use this to pressurize some fraction of the incoming uh, salty feed water with the outgoing brine. So usually they would have seawater here and outgoing brine here as a uh, initial preservation process to recover that pressure. Um, here, we have another batch reverse osmosis configuration, and we've proposed actually using it um, to label this tank to be at low pressure. And so in this alternative design, we have one fraction of the system that's a cyclical high pressure, and another fraction that's an atmospheric pressure. And effectively, once the feed leaves the system, all the energy is recovered into feed coming uh, into the system, and then the uh, Concentrated volume is being set to this variable pressure, this variable, sorry, this variable volume tank that is at atmospheric uh, pressure. And so this design lets us get rid of any complications that could arise with a high pressure tank, although we have some losses from this pressure exchanger. Now you'll note we have two pumps here. Why do we have two pumps? So effectively, the way these are designed um, typically means that they have to have the same fluoride on both sides. So that means this, because we're losing some pure water here, um, this uh, flow rate is larger than this flow rate, so we can't send all the water through this device. And because it's not perfectly efficient, we still need some pump to make up for the losses that occur in this flow loop. So a typical efficiency for these devices is on the order of 96%, so they are quite efficient. But again, the first uh, process was essentially, it's a piston, basically a frictionless piston is 100% efficient. So slightly better the first design, but perhaps there might be instances where this is uh, uh, more feasible. So how do we analyze these systems? Well, effectively, we take our little RO module. So we run a membrane here, um, a salty stream here, a pure stream here, and we divide it up into many, many discretized elements. And so we're effectively chopping it up, and then within each element, we calculate a mass balance of both water and salt, and we deal with the boundary layers that could be occurring. And so that will affect our mass transfer coefficients. And thus we can calculate the amount of flow that will go through the membrane in each stage. We also have to design this so the model is running over a long time period. Um, so the work for batch is a little more complicated. We have the brine ejection at the end. Um, and this occurs because you can have some mixing in that tank when you're sending in the new salty water in, uh, the new salt water in, which is less salty than the brine. Uh, and then you also have some circulation pump work. But overall, it comes out to be better and more about higher efficiency. We also see that when we model a system, uh, we can see the salinity will actually change over time along the length of one of these RO module tubes. And so this is an important effect of being able to model in detail to maximize and optimize your performance. So this is a comparison of these two te uh, configurations to all the competition out there uh, for relatively low uh, salinity uh, RO. So this is a regular RO, which is the main competition you see for, let's say, recovery from agricultural wastewater. Um, and so typically you're not, you're not usually using these PX or pressure recovery or pressure exchanger, which is why they call PX devices. Uh, you don't typically see those a lot because the energy savings are 
not as large um, for these lower salinity systems. So realistically, our processes are here and the competition's up here. But if we added the PX device, the competition's right here. Uh, this is the most efficient conventionally available process, a semi batch process called closed circuit reverse osmosis, which is similar but has continuous mixing, so it's a little less efficient. Uh, and then these are the two configurations I mentioned. The first configuration is slightly more efficient than the second configuration here. And we need some excess driving pressure in these systems, which is why we're still above this least work curve you see down here. As we get to higher salinities, it's easier to get closer to this least work curve. <coughs> and so these are our gaps between, for typical recoveries, between what is really the competition. And so you can see the main realistic competition needs close to twice the energy compared to this new process, especially at higher recovery ratio. So this is a, a, a contour map that maps the initial salinity as a function of this recovery ratio, you're fractionally desalinated, comparing continuous RO to these new batch RO designs. And you can see here that especially in high recovery, our second law of efficiency is vastly better, right? So, at, uh, and this is assuming this continuous RO has energy recovery on the right. So we're being generous on those assumptions. And so those systems get a lot more, uh, a, lot, a lot less efficient at higher recovery ratios because they have so much excess driving pressure, uh, especially early on in the modules. Uh, whereas we are exactly matching our applied pressure to the current salinity, and so we actually get improving second law efficiencies at higher recovery ratios. And you'll see these predicted recovery ratios are close, to, our energy efficiencies are close to 60%. Uh, this is still assuming fairly inefficient pumps. Uh, around 70% efficiency. So we're seeing that we can really get very impressive, very close to th uh, theoretical uh, uh, maximum efficiencies. And pumps can even be more efficient than what we proposed uh, in this system. Uh, the most efficient pumps in the market are over 90% efficient. So we can also do a drink. We can take those two graphs and we can directly compare them to one another. Um, so look at what is the energy efficiency improvement? And effectively for seawater, so this is taking those two graphs on the last slide, overlaying and comparing them. Seawater ranges, we're looking at about 35 grams per kilogram, or about 3.5% by weight of salt. And we're looking at energy savings on the order of low 20s percent, which is quite a lot, especially uh, considering that a lot of these really large multi-billion dollar contracts are awarded or won on one or two percent energy savings because they can give them better lifetime costs. So we're talking a few 20 plus, that can be a, a very big deal for these large systems. For these uh, water reuse systems that are looking at much lower salinities, so groundwater and water reuse, the gains are really incredible. Upwards of 60% plus energy efficiency gains made possible. Um, next, I want to go into talking about how this system can benefit on membrane fouling. Um, so we see the energy benefits. There's also some benefits in reducing membrane fouling. Now, for membrane fouling, there's a few types. There can be inorganic, which is salts, you know, calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate. There can be particulate fouling. There can be biofouling with organisms, uh, often bacteria. If you're really bad at pretreatment, you can even get like um, sea urchins, essentially, on some of the pretreatment membranes. This does happen. And then membrane damage over time, which can be from cracking, from intermittent operation, or from the cleaning steps. Often, to clean these membranes, we're using acidic or basic solutions, which are actually quite damaging to the membranes. And there's some trade-off inside how often we want to clean to maximize the lifetime of the membrane, given that both the fouling and the cleaning are both destroying our membranes and our process performance. So in a batch process, if we want to minimize the inorganic fouling, um, the concept here is it takes a long time for crystals to begin forming once your system becomes super saturated. Because we're having the second salinity, we can actually start out below the saturation salinity and go above it and then repeat. And as long as we design our system to be below the saturation salinity, we can continue to operate um, without having crystals form. Uh, and so we essentially want to stay in this no fouling regime by keeping our residence time in the system below the induction time. Meanwhile, if you think of the end of a continuous auto module, it's always at one constant high salinity. And so it's not going to change unless you do a cleaning, which happens once or twice a week typically. So that's a very long residence time, so it's going to be much more prone to inorganic fouling of salts. And for this paper, we use some reference equations on the induction time for various salts, calcium carbonate and calcium sulfate 
are two of the most relevant for uh, seawater and groundwater operation. So why do we have this nucleation energy barrier? Why is there a delay time? Essentially, if you want to form a new crystalline solution, once you're supersaturated, any crystal that's big enough to grow will grow. So there's a volumetric term saying, I don't want to be in solution, I want to be a crystal. But to form the first crystals to begin with, um, you need a lot more surface area, right? And there's actually a surface area term which is hurting you. And so until you get to this critical radius where the volumetric terms can deal with the surface area terms, you get redissolving back into solutions. So you go back down this curve here. Whereas once you hit this critical size, growth is favorable as opposed to unfavorable, and you get rapid crystal growth. And so statistically, eventually, getting into salinity, based on this, this uh, uh, radius, will be some crystal size that will cause runaway nucleation. So I don't want to go into the details, but effectively, we can create a non-dimensionalized framework to model when we would expect uh, a volume fluid balance that has enough uh, volume to form a stable crystal nucleus. We have enough time within the system, floating along the boundary layer, to actually be crystallizing, in crystallizing, and we can use that to make a non-dimensionalized framework with one or two terms like length, etc., length, etc. Uh, so really non-dimensionalized uh, to predict when fouling could occur. Um, and in this study here, so we did modeling where we looked at the expected crystallization given the residence times of um, solutions that either started at saturation, at 50% of the saturation concentration, or at 25% of the saturation concentration. We have a curve here for continuous and a curve here for batch. And the point at where they intersect tells you when you expect a foul to begin occurring. So effectively, for continuous RO, if your salt is initially about half, about half the uh, saturation, then we expect to start seeing fouling occurring upper 70%. But if you have batch RO, uh, you expect that your uh, crystallization will begin occurring once you are about at 93% or so uh, recovery, which means you need to vastly higher recovery or get much more water from the same even volume if you're using a batch based process. Um, traditional seawater is pretty close to saturation on this, and that's the main reason why the recovery is so poor. Essentially, they spend all this money treating and pre-treating all this water coming in, and they only get to 50, maybe 55 percent recovery. We can do the same thing for calcium carbonate. We see a similar trend. Essentially, the batch gets us a lot better. You notice this batch cycle only lasts a few minutes, whereas this continuous system might only be clean every once a week or so. So you literally have three plus orders of magnitude improvement in the residence time of the system, and that's really this big benefit. So you look at a few realistic water sources. We do a comprehensive model using uh, this software called Free, uh, P-H-R-E-Q-C, um, which models the saturation index of each, and then we can use those correlations from before to map the saturation index to when we would expect crystallization to occur. We can determine what the maximum recovery ratio could be. And we see that for seawater between batch and continuous, the batch processes all in, all in uh, blue here into much higher recovery. So the lowest curve for any scenarios is what's going to limit you. So essentially for seawater, a continuous process really starts crystallizing at 60%, but a batch process could, could potentially get you to upper 70s before crystallization could occur. This could mean you could get, you could take almost half that water which you're rejecting and recover for the majority of it um, so you have much more water from what you initially paid and spent all this money bringing into your plant, pumping it from the sea, and pre-treat. Um, and we see for groundwater, the difference is even more stark. As opposed to needing to 80% for average groundwater, and this is created by a USGS database looking at all the aquifers in the US, so the most representative we can make it, versus groundwater that's worse by one second deviation, we go from, let's say, 80 to up you know, low 90s, or somewhere in the 60s, um, to a, uh, over 80% recovery ratio. And the exact details and numbers are in my so we see really strong benefits. So where can we use this technology? Well, it actually, root osmosis has dominance in many different realms. So on the large scale for desalination, there are desalination plants that are producing hundreds of thousands of tons of water per day. In the US city of San Diego gets about a third of its municipal water through its new desal plant. So these are some really massive, think of like a, a gymnasium-sized rooms just filled with stacks and stacks of these membrane modules. 
this photo taken from one of my trips to um, San Diego uh, plant. Um, it can also be used for agricultural water reuse and is particularly the energy, energy savings for these high recoveries. Also, household disinfection is a major application for um, reverse osmosis. So you'll see a lot of the households in India, their infrastructure does not provide safe drinking water. And so they all have these little small uh, desalination units in their houses. Now the reason that these, um, one major reason that the water is so unsafe is that they're continually turning off their water distribution systems at night because their leaking issues are so dramatic. And that reduces their leaking, however, if you have a high pressure pipe and it's leaking some, it's keeping it from going back in. You shut it off, water from the ground can leak in. You may have other pipes that have some sewage. You may have sewage from the ground. You have issues with open defecation. So you have very unsafe water that can be re-entrained back into the pipes. The problem with the existing systems is they have very low recovery for the households, often be 25%. So they're increasing the demand on these water systems, which means they may even have to shut them off more to conserve more water. If we can get to higher recoveries, these systems can have, as opposed to 25%, we can make a small system with 70 plus. We can help mitigate that issue and improve the water supply and the water safety um, in areas that have this intermittent water grid. Also, because of these higher recovery ratios uh, could be, that are a result of uh, reduced fouling, we can extend the use of reverse osmosis to high salinity water, uh, such as for mining water treatment. So, some news we got to press and more today. We like the technology. Let's get that. Um, I want to highlight that one of my co-inventors was Emily Town, now a faculty at Olin College. Um, and we can see we have these big system benefits um, with the process. But what about its nanomaterials? Um, can we get further energy efficiency improvements from nanomaterial enhancements? So this is one of the most popular areas of research in the reverse osmosis and desalination space. So if you take a reverse osmosis module, kind of blow it up, we kind of have this spiral wound, circular, many layers of membranes. Now looking into that, could we improve that membrane? So for instance, we could use uh, a graphene-based membrane to have higher permeability. And permeability is one of the main metrics people use to optimize for overall performance. And we see that compared to traditional permeability, it's around one or two liters per meter squared hour per bar, on units, but that's how kind of they use. So normally around here, these high permeable membranes can be 10 plus, but you really see for seawater, you're already at diminishing returns. So for this batch row system, you can go from maybe around here to around here, so you're getting a few percent more energy improvement, but really, you're getting a lot more of your energy improvement from this new process design than from that you could from nanomaterials. Now we do, for lower salinity water, we do see this curve is a little less steep, so we could get further benefits, but still we see the process design is what we need to think about more than just the materials design. But we often need to consider both the material design and the process design together. So my own research my lab is in the Berkman Nanotechnology Technology Center here. And we focus a lot on how can we merge um, nanomaterial design with large-scale process models to actually make nanomaterials that perform well and are wise to use for large-scale processes. Really, we need both to make practical new materials and new process design. So what about cost savings? The real system we want to use is we need to substantially reduce costs. So these are some rough estimations on um, the uh, cost savings. So comparing batch reverse osmosis BRO to RO versus multi-effect distillation, the um, most efficient thermal desalination option, we see that the batch RO options uh, seem to be kind of the winner. And I've assumed that the UBRO and ultra permeable BRO, we've estimated those ultra permeable membranes are maybe 10 times as expensive. Um, so we're finding that it's not quite worth going to these more expensive membranes because even though you get a little more energy savings in these more expensive membranes, the gap from ERO to RO is much larger than you get from these super membranes. Um, however, if you could produce these membranes for only maybe 2.6 times the cost of regular RO membranes, then ultra criminal batch RO is now being the key against the most efficient desalination process. So, what are we doing now in the lab? We are trying to demonstrate, we some of those modeling results. We want to create these um, water energy microgrids that are using batch desalination, uh, as well as wind and solar power, to create little microgrids that can operate in remote regions and help solve heavy metal poisoning and um, a lacking water supply and waterborne disease that occur in areas such as Peru. 
but we also want to make them uh, more synergistically paired with one another. Another goal of this is we size the system to try to set a new energy record for batch RO. Um, it's going to be very challenging given that these are fairly small systems, and if you can think of these large desal pumps, will have these large desalination plants could have pumps that are as tall as I am, right? And those can get to very high efficiencies, you know, low 90s. But because our process design is so much better, we hope that we can still set the energy efficiency record with larger pumps. So we made, we made this trailer size skid to hopefully be large enough and the pumps can still be efficient enough to set this record in the hit. And we're hopefully going to be bringing this uh, test bed to implement in uh, Peru uh, this summer. So in terms of continuing projects, we're integrating uh, batch RO and RO with renewables. We're trying to make them more compatible with the bearing energy demands for renewables. Um, we're doing an energy record. We're doing hydraulic wind power combinations with reverse osmosis. We're doing applications to remote regions uh, and trying to understand how we can better remove dangerous compounds. And I also have some new work on anti-biofouling effects, which we're uh, currently running experiments on right now. I want to acknowledge our various hundreds of funding sources. A lot of this initial work was done uh, previously when I was at MIT. And I want to thank my, uh, my lab for the contributions. And I also have one of my students, Sandra, here. Uh, and the audience who is working on this project. And with that, I want to give the final takeaways. So desalination has the potential to uh, have tremendous benefits for the water energy from Nexus, but we really have to reduce the cost of water. These new process designs are going to be a key piece of really dealing with these water challenges in the future and making desalination and reverse osmosis a viable option. And there's some other benefits that we didn't put quite to as well, but these systems can really reduce the fouling and increase the operating range that these systems can operate in. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions.